Let the church say amen. amen. Would you bow in a moment of prayer? God, we thank you for your grace. Your grace is still sufficient. Thank you for meeting us with mercy. Thank you for ministering to us through the music. Now at the preaching time, please, we ask you, speak again. For somebody needs a word from you. Do it and we'll give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praises. And the people of God together will say, Amen. To our beloved host, Pastor Bowie. To his partner in marriage, ministry, life, and labor, Sister Bowie. As they enjoy the last Sunday of vacation. Amen. Dr. Clara Reed, Dr. Albano Tayengo, Reverend Sharon Larkin, and Minister LeBron James Michael <laughs> Jordan Payton Parker. I told him in between services, Muhammad Ali used to predict what round he was going to knock his opponent out, so I asked him to tell me how many points he was going to get today. You all be sure to tell me. He said a minimum of 12 and some assists <laughs> to these awesome musicians this powerful choir Ma Mary Kate Palmer used to sing in this choir when she was doing her residency down here as a medical doctor Manye, where did Manye go? Manye. <laughs> do you know do you remember Robert Wooten my best friend for 50 years ministered me his daughter Carol Wooten McDaniel and his granddaughter Lisa are here worshipping with us from Chicago. Deacon Regina Reed, Wendell, Wendell Wentz, a friend of God's, sitting next to Commissioner John Wiley Price, has driven in from Wimbledon to worship with us. We thank God for his presence and for all the visitors and friends. I was here last for Denise Johnson Stovall's funeral services. And since I left you, and St. Luke, I have had some serious medical challenges through which I'm living as we look at each other. I try to look at you. Security, I told the 8 o'clock worshiper, security, when I got out of Commissioner Price's car, he said, you had the air conditioner up so high, your glasses fogged up. <laughs> this is not fog, it's not a dirty glass, it's a patch I can't see. I have ocular neuropathy and diplopia. So I'm asking you to pray for me as I try to preach with you this Sunday. I told the folk last week in the Amy Zion Church while trying to preach, the doctors say there's nothing that can be done. And God may not heal me, but I do know that he's a healer. <laughs> Even if he doesn't heal me. If you have your scriptures with you or your smartphones, the scripture will be found in the fourth chapter of Mark's Gospel, the King James Translation. The media ministry is going to put it up on the screen so that you may read along with us as we all read together verses 35 through 41. And the same day when the even was come, he said unto them, let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent the multiple, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they were feared exceedingly 
and said one to another, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea? Would you repeat these words after me? And he said unto them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? As you have your seats in the presence of our God, I want you to pray with me for the second service this Sunday on the theme, When Fear Trumps Faith. All my big whisk players know what the word Trump means. When fear trumps faith. Jesus said unto them, let us go over to the other side. The disciples, in this passage, we're doing what Jesus asked them to do. And they ran into a storm. The text says they ran into a great storm. A big storm came up unexpectedly. A huge storm came up out of nowhere while they were doing what the Lord asked them to do. How many times have you found yourself in a storm that came up unexpectedly? that came up out of nowhere. I'm talking to somebody worshiping at St. Luke this Sunday. Talking to somebody who feels stuck in a storm. A storm in your personal life. A storm in your relationship life. A storm in your married life. Somebody married looking at me right now. You got home last night, you hit the remote, the door went up, and your heart sank because the other car was in there. You knew you were walking into a storm. Somebody feels stuck. A storm in your church life. Let me tell you a couple of three things that the years have taught me about storms and trouble in our lives before I share with you what the Lord showed me about this passage. First thing I learned is Dr. William Augustus Jones was right. Dr. Bill Jones, former pastor of the Bethany Baptist Church of Brooklyn, New York, author of the powerful book, God in the Ghetto. Dr. Jones told our congregation 35 years ago that everybody under the sound of his voice, just like everybody under the sound of my voice at St. Luke this morning, you are in one of three different categories. Either you are in a storm, or you're coming out of a storm, or you're heading into a storm and don't even know it. Some storms come up out of nowhere. Some trouble we run into on our journey is unexpected trouble. Number two, I learned concerning storms, that there is no such thing as a trouble-free existence. There's no such thing as a trouble free. Somebody's missing this. Turn to your neighbor. Turn to your neighbor. Put a smile on your face. Say this to your neighbor. There's no such thing, no such thing. As, a as a trouble free life. It does not matter what you heard on television. It does not matter what you heard your favorite preacher say. It does not matter what your favorite gospel recording artist sang. There is no such thing as a trouble free life. Now, before you run out of here and tell somebody, Jeremiah Wright was over saying, Luke contradicting what I heard about positive thinking and <laughs> the word of faith theology. Don't quote Jeremiah Wright. Quote Jesus. Jesus said, in this life, you will have tribulation. In this life, you will run into storms. In this life, you're going to have some trouble. In this life, you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Turn back to your neighbor and say, there's no such thing as a trouble-free life. What, what does Psalm 27 say? Quote Psalm 27 to your friends. In the time of trouble, he shall hide me. In this life, you're going to have some trouble. In this life, you will run into some storm. What does Psalm 46 say? Quote Psalm 46 to your friends. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. In this life, you're going to have some trouble. In this life, you'll run into the storm. What, what does Psalm 23 say? A lot of non-Bible studies don't, don't come to the disciple class. Didn't make last year. You ain't going to make this year. 
You don't know how to find Psalm 46 or Psalm 27, but everybody know Psalm 23. What does Psalm 23 say? Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my. Now enemies means you're going to run into some trouble in this life. You're going to run into some storm. No such thing as a trouble-free life. Turn back to your neighbor and say, guess what that means? Tell them that means there's no such thing as a trouble-free relationship. Did my son Freddie Haynes make it to this service last night? He said he was gonna to try to make it to this service. Freddie Haynes, Friendship West, Freddie Haynes puts it this way. If the grass looks greener on the other side of that relationship fence, it might be cause the water bill is higher on the other side of that fence. Somebody is paying a high price to keep up appearances. No such thing as a trouble-free relationship. Lance Watson, who preaches for Freddie at Friendship West, Lance Watson, pastor of St. Paul's Church in Richmond, Lance says the relationship problem stems from the fact of communication and the differences in communication. See, men speak in headlines. Women speak in fine print. <laughs> communication. After service today, y'all go home. Brother gonna be on the phone in the living room. And his partner called him. Man, where were you all looking for you this morning? Went over to St. Luke. Oh, what did Bowie preach about? Bowie ain't there. It was this dude from Chicago. That's him. That's him. And sister girlfriend be on her phone, girl, you ought to hear the choir. You know, there's something about God's grace. They sang it, something about God's grace. And Manya, Manya changed clothes. She had, on, she had on the same color the men in the morning that she had on blue for some. Fine, fine print. Communication experts say that men, on average, use 10,000 words a day. Women, on average, use 35,000 words a day. And by the time the brother gets home from work, he has used 9,994 of his words. So when his lady asks him, how was your day? He uses the last six words, fine, what we got for dinner. And he's through. <laughs> Dr. Watson, Lance Watson, preached a sermon, I think he did it at Friendship West, he's done it all over this country. Comes, the sermon comes from a title of a book, Men are like waffles. Women are like what? Spaghetti. Y'all heard that sermon. Next time you go to IHOP, next time you go to the Waffle House, next time you go to the freezer and pull a waffle out, look at it. You'll see on the waffle there are these little boxes. That's how men communicate. We have a box for Sunday morning church. We have another box for paying bills. We have an NFL box. We have a wife box. We have a cheering box. We have a making love box. Now when we in the NFL box, don't try to get us over here to the making love box. Because we only do one box at a time. You ever notice when you pour syrup on a waffle, inevitably the syrup will skip around one box, it just won't go in that box? That's our nothing box. When the brother comes home from work, he's tired, had a rough day, he just wants to get in the nothing box and chill. And here you come. What you thinking about? Now his eyes go to flitting around the kitchen because he got to say something. Because if he says nothing, oh, you don't want to tell me what you're thinking about. <laughs> we do one box at a time. Women are like spaghetti. Next time you have some spaghetti on your plate, pick up one strand of spaghetti and watch what happens. You will disturb 10 to 15 other strands of spaghetti because that's how you all think that's how you all communicate that's how you all multitask you're stirring something on the stove you're talking on the phone the child leave the door when you close the door with your foot you keep right on talking 
like spaghetti, you got several stream of consciousness thought that there's a communication problem. He traces conflict in relationship, no such thing as a trouble-free relationship. He traces it, Dr. Watson, to communication. Now that's how Freddie Haynes puts it, that's how Lance Watson puts it. I've explained it this way for at least a quarter of a century. If the grass looks greener on the other side of that relationship fence, you better look again, because it just might be artificial turf you're looking at. <laughs> Turn back your neighbor and say, there's no such thing as a trouble-free relationship. Still trying to help somebody here this Sunday morning. 15 years ago, another one of my sons in the ministry, Reverend Dr. Ozzie Smith, I was talking to him, talking about him with, with Commissioner Wiley. He is the saxophone playing pastor. He taught Kirk Whalem his acts. He's from Memphis, Tennessee. And when I preached about artificial turf, he ran home to Memphis, told his mama, Pastor Wright said, if the grass looks greener, it might be because it's artificial turf. She's from Memphis. He's 85 years old. She said, you go back and tell Pastor Wright, if the grass looks greener on the other side of the fence, it might be because it's sitting on top of some septic tanks. <laughs> now, for my millennials, my, my millennials don't know what that is. That means they're sitting on a lot of poo-poo. a lot of poo-poo pushing up that grass. If you are in a relationship, you're gonna run into trouble. Frankie Beverly and Mays, Frankie Beverly, Frankie Beverly, Freddie Haynes' cousin is, the first cousin is their manager. She makes all the arrangements for their tours. Frankie Beverly and Mays do it where they call it joy and pain. It's like, and now because Freddie loves him some Frankie, he thinks that's old school. I said, no, Freddie, Fred, Joy and Pain, that's a recent song. That's within the last 10, 15 years. That, you don't know what old school is. Freddie said, Daddy, yeah, I know. I said, no, let me give you some OG old school about trouble-free relationships. Here's OG. Tell me what's wrong. Tell me why. Never seem to make you happy, though heaven knows I try. You say it's me who argues, I say it's you. We have got to get together, oh. old school then you hate me that's a game for no such thing as a trouble free relationship turn back to your neighbor and say I got one more thing for you not only is there no such thing as a trouble free life no not only is there no such thing as a trouble-free relationship, there is also no such thing, look at them, say no such thing, no such thing. as a trouble-free church. <laughs> getting into a church is like getting into that boat that they got in verse 36. You're getting into the old ship of Zion, you're journeying with Jesus, but sooner or later, you're gonna run into some trouble. An unexpected storm will come up out of nowhere. No such thing as a trouble-free church. Now, those are the things I learned about storms. Everybody in here is one of three categories. No such thing as trouble-free existence. And this third thing the text teaches me is that many times when a storm is fierce enough, it will cause fear to overrule faith. Look what Jesus says in verse 40. Why are you so fearful? That's the verse I had you repeat. How is it that you have no faith? Fierce storms many times cause fear to overrule faith. Fierce storms many times cause 
fear, to win out over faith. Fear storms can cause your fears to trump your faith. How many times have you heard somebody else say, I don't want you to confess. You might have thought it, but you probably didn't say it. I didn't have this kind of trouble while I was in the world. I didn't catch this kind of hell until I got into church. Go back to my opening sentence. The disciples in this text are doing what Jesus asked them to do and they ran into a storm. They ran into a great storm. A big storm came up out of nowhere. A huge storm came up unexpectedly while they were doing what the Lord asked them to do. And a fierce storm caused their fears to trump their faith. Now look at this text with me. When you are in a storm, and even if you are not presently, right now, in a storm in your personal life, physically or spiritually, you're not in a storm in your married life, you're not in a storm in your relationship life, you're not in a storm in your church life, I got a hot flash for you in case you had not noticed. We are all in a storm in this country's life. Mass incarceration, health care inequities, wealth gap inequities, the destruction of public education, disregard for black lives from Ferguson to Flint, militarized police, tanks, Humvees, and body armors in our city streets. How far have we come from the bombs in Birmingham in Martin Luther King's day to the murder of black men and women in Barack Hussein Obama's day? How far have we come from the murder of Emmett Till by white racists to the murder of Freddie Gray by white and black police? How far have we come from the shooting and murder of Medgar Evers to the shooting and murder of Trayvon Martin, from the white robe wearing terrorists of the Ku Klux Klan to the poison water distributors in Flint and Detroit, Michigan, from the killings by lead in the bullets to the killings by lead in the water. In case you haven't noticed, we are in a huge storm. And with the nominee from the GOP whose name is in the title of this sermon, when fear trumps faith, a misogynist Trump, a racist Trump, a sexist Trump, a Muslim hating Trump, a Mexican hating Trump, a bold, brash, billionaires saying out loud publicly what racists have been saying on the DL all along privately. Why do you think he won all those primaries? His finger is on the pulse of racist America. One finger that is. His other finger is on the trigger of a pistol paid for by the NRA. In case you had not noticed, we are in a huge storm and we are headed for a hurricane. But I stopped by St. Luke this morning to warn somebody not to let the fierceness of this storm allow your fears to trump your faith. Why? Because when fear trumps faith, the text says believers forget. Say that out loud. Believers forget. First, they forget what the sovereign said. In verse 35, the sovereign says, let us go over to the other side. He did not say, let us go under. The waves are swamping into the boat, so let's go drown together. No, he said, let us go over. They forgot what he said when fear trumps faith. We forget what he said. What did he say about storms? Isaiah 43, when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. Don't forget what he said. What did he say? Isaiah 54, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Don't forget what he said. What did he say? Psalm 30, weeping may endure for a night, but joy is coming in the morning. Don't forget what he said. What did he say? Hebrews 13 I will never leave you nor forsake you and that segues into the second thing that believers forget when fear trumps faith the text says the first thing believers forget is what he said the second thing they forget is where they were say where they were where, they were. where, where were they they were with him on a journey to the other side he said let us go and they took him, verse 36 says, they took him with them. He was right there with them. 
They were not alone in the storm. They were with him in the storm. He was with them in the storm. And he will be with you through the storm. He will be with you through this storm. Don't forget what he said. And don't forget where you are and who you're with. Now that's bad grammar but good theology. <laughs> who are you with in this storm? Come on back to Isaiah 43. The sovereign says, when you pass through the storm, I will be with you. When you go through the storm, I will be with you. And please don't miss that word, T-H-R-O-U-G-H, through. A storm is something you go through. Storms don't last forever. Trouble doesn't last forever. The Africans enslaved in the storm of human bondage saying, I'm so glad, trouble don't last always a storm is something you go through charles albert tenley the african-american methodist pastor wrote a hymn we all sing it today take courage my soul let us journey on though the night is dark it won't be very long thanks be to god the morning light appears the storm is passing over hallelujah remember where you are on a journey going through Remember who you're with and remember who's with you as you go through. When fear trumps faith, the text says believers forget. First they forget what the sovereign said. Then they forget that they are with him. They forget he's with them. Matthew 14, 28 is a companion scripture, one of my favorite companion scripture which supplements, stand side by side this Mark 4 passage. It became alive for me 36 years ago. Matthew 14 28 let me see the hands of those of you you better put your hand up too Jerry who have been fathers of teenage daughters Jerry your hand in there thank you those of you who've been fathers of teenage daughters will understand what I'm getting ready to tell you 36 years ago one of my daughters was 15 14 really and she was in love Love, 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 I mean, endless love with a 19-year-old Negro. <laughs> now, in the state of Illinois, that's called statutory rape. I don't know what they call it in Texas. But in Illinois, I wanted to hurt somebody. I couldn't stand him. I was in a storm, y'all. I could not stand him or his mama. I'm taking my daughter to school, Lynn Bloom High School. She getting out the car. I watch her walk in the front door of the school, not knowing that his mama is sitting at the side door so she can go out the side door, get in his mama's car, where she takes her to her home, giving her reefer so she and her son can have. Listen here. That's some street in there, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> we went to family therapy, Vanessa. We in family therapy. And the therapist said, we need a meeting. We need a meeting of the parents so the parents can put some parameters around this relationship. I ain't had no meeting on my mind. I had murder on my mind. <laughs> I'm catching hell. I got to preach Sunday morning. I'm telling the Lord, look at here. When you gonna say peace, be still? When you gonna get, you see, the, you see I'm in the middle of this storm? When you gonna get, a, you did it for them. How come you ain't doing it for me? Come on, say something. I didn't use no caris thou not that we perish. What's wrong with you, dude? Yo, it's me. And in my morning devotion, I ran across Matthew 14, 20. There was another storm. Jesus sent the disciples across the lake, and he went up in the mountain to pray. They got out in the lake. A storm came up. When he saw they were in trouble, he walked on the water to be with them. Now, we always focus on his walking on the water. Peter said, is that really you telling me to come here and all that? But look what the text says. He walked on the water. He said, don't be afraid. It's me. I'm with you. He takes Peter, pulls him up out of the water, and they get into the boat, and the storm died down all on its own. What was the text saying to me? The text was saying, Jesus does not always still the storm and calm the storm. Sometimes he calms the believer in the middle of the storm. He says, I am with you. Even as we go through this storm, I'm right here beside you. Just his presence calms my doubts and soothes my fear while he stands with me in the storm. 
And that points to the ultimate thing that I say believers forget that this text teaches when fear trumps faith. Look at the text, verse 41, which says they were still afraid. They feared exceedingly. And when they said to one another, what manner of man in this, that even the wind and the waves obey him, that says to me, they not only forgot what he says, now let's go over. They not only forgot where they were, us means they were with him, he was with them. They also forgot who he was. Say what he said. Say where they were. Say who he was. Now verse 38, they called him master. Master carest thou not, but they forgot that he was not only their master, he was also the master of ocean and earth and sky. They forgot who he was. John said all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. They forgot who he was. He was the same Jesus who rode through 42 generations of the prophets. He was the same Jesus who in Mark 1 cured a man who had come to church with the devil in him. Can you imagine that? Somebody in St. Luke with the devil in him? If you come into his presence, he can get out of you anything that keeps you from being in a right relationship with God. They forgot who he was. He was the same Jesus who went to Simon Peter's home after church and lifted Simon Peter's mother-in-law up off of her sick bed, restoring wholeness to her body. They forgot who he was. He was the same Jesus who healed like a doctor man, taught like a teacher man, and fed 5,000 like a grocery man. They forgot who he was don't forget in the midst of this mess that we are in as we go through our storm that he's the same jesus today that he was on yesterday he's the same jesus who not only rode through 42 generations of the prophets he also rode in the bellies beneath the decks of stinking slave ships calming his believers who cried out lord have mercy don't forget who he is turn to your neighbor and say don't forget who he is He's the same Jesus who made 19 trips back into the south with Reverend Harriet Tubman to free enslaved Africans from the storm of slavery that they were going through. Don't forget who he is. He is the same Jesus who walked the dusty roads of Galilee, yes, but he also walked the segregated streets of Montgomery, Alabama to bring a racist bus company down to its knees. Don't forget who he is. He's the same Jesus who spoke out on a stormy sea who spoke and healed the daughter of a Syrophoenician woman, a black woman, who also spoke and healed the servant of a Roman centurion, a white man. He's the same Jesus who speaks and demons tremble, who speaks and his voice is so sweet that the birds hush their singing. He's the same Jesus who is still speaking today. He's the same Jesus who walks with me when the media messes with me. Who walks with me when folk walk away from me? Who talks with me when so-called friends talk about me? He's the same Jesus who tells me I am his own. Isaiah 43, he says, I have redeemed you. You are mine. He's the same Jesus who exchanged his life for mine. Don't forget who he is. Who is he? He's the same Jesus who thought I was worth saving. Now, you can start playing it softly. <laughs> the Wooten family knows this, the Trinity family knows this, some of the Friendship West family knows this. I don't think I've ever said this to St. Luke. But I ain't been in the church. Zan Holmes, my hero. Freddie Haynes, my hero. They've been saved since the time they were little boys. They ain't never left the church. But I left the church. I got tired of church folk and church mess. Negroes arguing about who gonna be the president. Choirs arguing over what color the robe gonna be. Are we gonna have the initials on the inside of the sleeve or the outside? When I went into the Marine Corps, I quit college in my last year and went to the Marine Corps. I didn't do church. I had nothing to do with nobody's church. Except when I went to Philadelphia to visit my mama and daddy, I ain't stupid. <laughs> And in the sixth year that I was in the military, the sixth year, 1966, I was sitting on the front steps of the Mount Calvary Baptist Church in Rockville, Maryland, 
you sang there. You sang there. It was a Saturday afternoon. The church was closed up tight. Wasn't no, nobody in the church. Wasn't nothing happening in the church. I was sitting on the front steps of the church. Me and two of my partners who were stationed with me at Bethesda Naval Medical Center. We were sitting on the steps of the church solving the problems of the world with a fifth of Taylor Port wine. You know, Taylor Port wine will make you a philosopher. Yeah. This was 1966. This was the year after Malcolm X had been murdered. And me and my partner said, you know, the nation did that. I don't care what they say, the nation of Islam did that. And we were talking about Christianity, we were talking about the nation, we were talking about the difference between the nation of Islam and Sunni Islam. We were talking about the fact that 600 years before Christians were taking Africans into slavery, Muslims were taking Africans into slavery. Muslims took Africans across the Sahara into slavery, they took them across the Indian Ocean, oh doc, we were into it. And this old dude walked up and got in the conversation with us. I was 26, 25, going on 26, he was 63, he was an old dude. He got in the conversation, he started trying to defend Christianity. I offered Herod another drink, he, he, he didn't want no more, more for me. I talked about the racism of Christianity, I talked about how the slave trade was not the Atlantic slave trade, the Atlantic didn't carry nobody into slavery, that was the European slave trade. Europeans took us into slavery. Europeans not only took us into slavery in the 15th century, but they also changed all the pictures in the Bible. They made everybody in the Bible white. There wasn't nobody in the Bible white till you get to the New Testament. But that's what they did. Michelangelo's up in the Sistine Chapel has a white God reaching down to a white Adam. Leonardo da Vinci got a white Jesus sitting at a table like he's sitting in, in Europe. Palestinians did not sit at tables like that. They reclined on one side. Oh, we were, he was trying to defeat it. I was giving him the blues. Offered out another drink. He didn't want them. No you don't want them no more either? More for me. <laughs> See, they knew that this old dude who was in our conversation trying to defend the church was the pastor of the church whose steps we were sitting on. <laughs> from around there. I ain't had hey, this much wine left in the bottle? Like Freddie Haynes says, on like neck bones, it's going down like four flat tires. We got into it. We got into it. My partners left me there with the man. We talked for four hours. At the end of four hours, he took his card and gave me his card. He said, listen, son, I want you to answer a question for me. Not now. Not, be not now. Not because of the wine. The wine been gone. I want you to think about what I want to ask you. And, and give me a call when you get an answer. He said, I hear you angry with what racists have done to Christianity. I hear you angry with what racism has done to Christianity. I hear you angry with what jacklegs have done to Christianity. But I don't hear you mad at Jesus. I don't hear you angry with it. In fact, you know what? I got a feeling that you love the church very much. And my question for you is this. Where do you think you can do the most good loving the church like my gut tells me you love it. On the outside throwing stones at it or on the inside working to make it become what Jesus meant when Jesus founded it. Just give me an answer when you think that through. I took the card and went home. Saturday afternoon. I got up Sunday morning. Start getting ready for church. My wife said, where you going? <laughs> said to church. Come on, go to church with me. Now, sisters, I think she said, what's the witch's name? <laughs> Sounded like that's what she said. <laughs> I said, no, 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 no. See, remember the old dude I told you about? This is his car. Come on, go with me. She said, no. I went to church to check it. I said, he got a good rap on the sidewalk. I want to see what he talks like inside the church. So I went to church, but like, like some of you at St. Luke this morning when you heard Jeremiah Wright's name, I went to the church critical. I went to the church to critique everything that was going to be happening. I had my pen and my paper critiquing everything. When I got to the church, now for young people, millennials, y'all don't know about this, there was no praise team, there was no praise and worship. The deacons lined up in front of the church. And the deacons will give you the nod when it's your turn to testify. Yeah. 
doing devotion, they call that devotion. There wasn't no piano, there wasn't no organ doing devotion. And they started singing songs like, I love the Lord, he heard my cry. Then at 11 o'clock, they handed the microphone to the pulpit, and as the pastor took the pulpit, the willing and able choir came up into the choir stand. Y'all know about the willing and able choir? That's where you got more folk who are willing <laughs> than who are able. <laughs> The P9 has hit one little note, doom. And the willing and able choir say, Let the words of my mouth, mm. let the words of my mouth, and the meditation of my heart. I said, Don't nobody want to hear no stuff like that on a Sunday morning. They chanted the Lord's Prayer. Then they handed the mic to Deacon Jones. Deacon Jones took a chair, knelt down beside the chair. I had never been in that church in life. I did not know Deacon Jones, but I promise you I can say his prayer right along with him word for word. Most holy, all wise, and everlasting God, our heavenly Father, tis once more and again that a few of your servants come before you. With our head bowed toward our mother's dust, but our heart turned toward we come because you's God all by yourself. And you don't need nobody else. You's God a long time ago. Scooped out the seeds with the palm of your hand and walled it up with the pebbles there. Give us the kind of religion that run from heart to heart and breast to breast. The kind of religion make a dancing woman hang up her shoes, make a gambler man throw his car. Drinking man get rid of his body. And win, 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 win. Win, 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 win. When the choir have sang the last anthem and the preacher have prayed the Say everybody know that prayer. We've been listening to that prayer all our lives. Give us a home in the place and we see what Job said we can just see some trumpet. I say everybody prays that prayer. Then the willing and able choir came out the choir stand and the cavalry crusaders took the choir stand. Henry Davis Jr., classmate of Richard Smallwood, founder of the Howard University Gospel Choir, slid on the Hammond B3 organ while the choir took his place. He started playing the introduction. Now listen carefully because I don't want you not to understand what I'm getting ready to say. 66 years ago, it's 50 years ago, I was homophobic 60 years ago. Thank God I have been cured of that disease and that demon has been ripped up out of me. I am not homophobic today. But 50 years ago, I was homophobic. Didn't even know I was homophobic. I would just start to stay away from them people. And while the organ was playing, the soloist glided to the mic. I said, see, this is why black men aren't in church right now, 1966. This is why. I'm... The brother opened his mouth, started singing. He sang better than Luther, so I crossed that off my list. I said, well, we all have different gifts. And then when Reverend Brooks started preaching, he preached from Matthew 16. They came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, and Jesus said unto them, Who do men say that I am? Some say you're Isaiah, some say you're Elijah, some say you're Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Fine. Who do you say that I am? And at that point, it sounded like Reverend Brooks was talking to me. Who do you say that I am? Because it is not who the prophet Muhammad five years after Jesus said Jesus is. It is not who Elijah Muhammad 2,000 years after Jesus said Jesus is. It is not who Malcolm X, al Haj Malik al-Shabazz says Jesus is. It is not who Louis Farrakhan says Jesus is. It is not who your mama or your grandmama said Jesus is. It's not who your daddy, mama and them say. Who do you say that he is? And all day Saturday while we were arguing, he kept saying, you're right, son, you're right, son. And all day Sunday while he was preaching, I kept saying, you're right, sir, you're right, sir. And when he opened the doors of the church, the old critic me, 
went there sarcastically, went there negatively, found myself in the aisle with water coming down my cheeks. He took me from drinking wine on the steps of the sanctuary to serving communion behind the altar inside the sanctuary because he thought I was worth saving. He thought I was worth keeping. He thought I was to die for. So he sacrificed his life so I could be free, so I could be whole, so I could tell everyone I know Jesus, the Christ, is the Son of the living God. He thought I was worth saving. Come on, stand to your feet. To my life, he thought I was worth keeping. What did he do? What did he do? 